most important thing we learned from Mark Ellis is the fact of war crimes, preserving evidence, the revelation that, in fact, Michael Sharp was out there last night with his band. And <laughs> Mike's uh, admission that that in and of itself was a war crime, and I downloaded to Mark Ellis minutes ago the only evidence of that war crime. So, Michael, you'll have a chance to see that. Uh, it, it's now preserved forever. It's in that locker, I believe was the term he used, that uh, we'll, we'll preserve. So, yes, thank you for, you know, setting the stage and having that moment of admission, which also was on, on, on stage. So we're here to talk about the founders. And that's this book, for those who haven't, it's got it. It's, it's an incredible uh, book it, it, entitled uh, The Founders, the Four Pioneering Individuals Who Launched the First Modern Era International Criminal Tribunals. The first time the four of them have ever been together on a panel. Historic. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact they're in and of themselves individually historically incredible personages, uh, to have them one place, one time to talk about one book which was edited by David Crane and Leila Sadat and Michael Sharp. Uh, all of them were contributors in this, in and to this book. And so uh, we're here to chat a little bit about this. And to sort of set the stage uh, is, I'm going to turn to David because this has a backstory as to why there was even uh, interest in this book and kind of what launched it. So David, why don't you set the stage? Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, and, and it is uh, an amazing moment uh, for me personally to, to be with my colleagues here, but also with you as well. And uh, it occurred to me, gosh, no more than about uh, five weeks ago, that all four of us are actually going to be here. And I reached out to Jim, and I said, you know, you really should probably do something. This is, you know, this is kind of, in my opinion, a significant moment. And so Jim was gracious enough to, to add this program to you, and I hope that you find it important as well, but it is one of those moments that you just really can't pass up. You know, the idea of the book and the idea of the founders, it occurred to me as we were sitting on the porches of, uh, I believe, the 11th International Humanitarian Law Dialogue, sitting right on that corner there, as we listen to Michael Sharp and his, his great positions. Uh, we were sitting around with a group of prosecutors, and we had uh, the usual uh, Chautauqua thing in our hand. We either called it beer, wine, or water, or whatever, mainly beer and wine. And I just posed this, this question to my colleagues. I said, uh, did any one of us ever, like, did any one of you actually apply to be a chief prosecutor? You know, and you could see smoke coming out of everybody's ears because, you know, it was one of these funny moments where everybody never really thought about that. As it turns out, and there were, I think, six or seven of us, none of us, none of us sought, uh, asked, applied for, or demanded to become a chief prosecutor of, of an international tribunal, let alone found a, a tribunal. And so we all went around and we explained how we became or, you know, were introduced to the idea of being a chief prosecutor. And it all turned out each and every one of us got the phone call out of the clear blue sky, literally the clear blue sky, uh, by somebody. Now, for you, it was Nelson Mandela, I believe, wasn't it, Richard, if I recall? Well, don't uh, steal this story. Okay, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> For me, it was uh, Richard Haas uh, at, the, at the White House. I mean, for me, to my, you know, my phone call was uh, 7 o'clock at night, DC Wonk, uh, had just spent 12 hours. Hey, did, you, did you miss the script? We're going to kind of walk oh, okay. down the call here. So, bottom line is, bottom line, and I apologize, obviously, I'm, I'm off the reservation. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is I, as I was going around the table, I realized that there's been never any book about this, about just how did this all went, go down. And so as I was flying home, uh, now to Maggie Valley, North Carolina, in the Smoky Mountains, I thought, you know, that would be a heck of a book. And so the next year, we were having our gathering at Nuremberg. And so I had all my colleagues, uh, a couple of, uh, several prosecutors, but also, you know, they're really the, the smart thinkers uh, in the room. And so uh, Michael Sharp, like I said, Dodd, 
uh, Warren Chavis, Hans Corral, uh, and David Sheffer, we all got together over breakfast one morning and I introduced the idea of why don't we write a book? And everybody kind of looked at me uh, and said, that's not a bad idea. And so the rest is history. So I will, I will stop there before I get the hook, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the foreword to the book, which uh, is written by Kofi Annan, which is amazing in itself that he, was, he did something which uh, uh, he really, as I understood it, not often did. Uh, but the first paragraph was such that he quoted Robert Jackson, the common sense of mankind demands that law shall not stop with the punishment of penny crimes by little people. It must also reach men who possess themselves of great power. And there was a sense, and this is for, for Richard, uh, the first tribunal is uh, the ICTY, and maybe you can give a little backstory about, you know, maybe a little bit about you, uh, the, the, the abridged version, and then how you got the call. Well, I, I, I knew little about the ICTY. I followed it uh, really as a, 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 from a very layman's point of view, we have to say that. I was Security Council in 1993. Um, I've never been a prosecutor. I've, I've, I've tried some criminal cases, but, but my, my area of expertise was commercial law, not, not, not criminal law. So I've never a prosecutor. I knew next to nothing about the former Yugoslavia. And I knew nothing, literally, about international humanitarian law. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, in, in my own mind, uh, uh, of, uh, interested in any way in, in the and becoming involved with the ICTY, but that changed very quickly in, in, a, in, a, in a momentous week for me. On, on the Monday, I was informed by our new, new uh, democratically elected Minister of Justice that, that, that I was going to be invited to be on the first constitutional court of South Africa, which was a dream position. And two days later, a, a fax from, uh, from Antonio Pesesi, the president of the ICTY, asking if I was interested in becoming the chief prosecutor of the ICTY, which I found amusing and, <laughs> and, 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 and a bit ridiculous. And I was drafting a polite uh, no um, when my phone rang and it was Nelson Mandela. Um, he, he had a, an endearing habit of always making his own phone calls. And there was this unmistakable voice saying, push up. <laughs> Mr. President, he said, uh, I believe you've been invited to become the prosecutor of the ICTY. And, and I said, yes, and in fact, Mr. President, I was drafting a polite no thank you, and he asked me my reason, and I told him the three reasons, each of which disqualified me. And, and he then said, well, don't be in a hurry to send your refusal. So I said, why not? He said, because I've just told the Secretary General that you will do it. <laughs> Well, the Constitution, it was the infant Constitution, 
They hadn't thought about two things about the Constitutional Court. There's no provision for a quorum. So all 11 members had to sit. Uh, and, and, and they hadn't thought about appointing, about acting appointments to, to the Constitutional Court. So they, they had to do both of those things to, to allow me to go. Did, did, did I, just out of curiosity, did, the, did Jackson had been, got confronted with that same thing by, because of the Supreme Court having been asked to leave the Supreme Court to become a prosecutor? Did, did that ever come up? No, it didn't. I only found, I only got that history later, uh, that the that in fact uh, Justice Jackson, as I understand it, didn't seek permission from the Chief Justice no. because he knew what the answer would be. And, and he simply accepted President Truman's invitation. I suppose it was, it was, it, it was similar to President Mandela's invitation. <laughs> so out of curiosity, that's, that gets you to Yugoslavia. You're the, be, you've accepted the position of the Chief Prosecutor at the ICTY. Then shortly thereafter, there's another tribunal created. How did, how did you all of a sudden become chief prosecutor of both? Well, uh, the, the, this, this was really the politics. The Security Council uh, had decided to set up the Rwanda Tribunal against the wishes of the Rwanda government, which was then a non-permanent member of the Security Council. And the, the, this, the, the, the UN, and probably it started at, 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 uh, with the Secretariat, didn't want a different prosecutor uh, for, for each of the two ad hoc tribunals. They thought that one in Africa, one in, one in Europe, we want consistency of, 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 of the process and, uh, and, uh, and we want one prosecutor. And uh, I, I, I was consulted but again had little choice. That, that was the political decision taken. And so overnight I became, in fact, one, one, one witty journalist said that in the case of the ICTY, for, for its first year, it, 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 it was a tribunal without a prosecutor, and, uh, and in the case of the Rwanda, it was a prosecutor without a tribunal, <laughs> <laughs> which was fairly accurate, but that, that, that was the reason for it. Okay, so then shortly thereafter, uh, uh, incidents occurred in Sierra Leone, and David, uh, uh, you get, things happen, and you get the call. Had you been following what was going on at all in Sierra Leone, Liberia, the whole Charles Taylor, is that something that was even on your uh, knowledge base before they got you engaged? Well, I'd like to say yes, and I was following it closely, and I was very much up to speed and was the right guy for the job. I, had, <laughs> I, did, I thought the Sierra, Sierra Leone was in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, but... Uh, <laughs> you quote it now. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I hadn't been. Uh, I mean, I... I, I I was a senior executive in the Department of Defense, and I was aware of conflicts. And I, I, I was vaguely aware that there was this dark hole in West Africa that uh, that no one spoke about, but yet it was apparently horrific. So I knew a, I knew a, the general idea that there was a terrible thing going on, but I had never really gotten into the uh, the nitty gritty of that. David, what was your background? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I uh, like like Richard. Uh, uh, yes, I happened to uh, be a judge advocate uh, uh, for many years, and yes, I happened to help develop the DOD Law of War program uh, after my lie and, and train judge advocates around the world at the Judge Advocate General School for a couple of years as the professor of law there. At, and so I did have a, I did have a professional uh, legal uh, basis. I did understand uh, the laws of armed conflict, international humanitarian law at the time of what it was, which was very, very nascent. And for a while there, my department was the only training facility for anybody going to the ICTY uh, and the ICTR. No, there was no law in this area. There was just Nuremberg, and uh, yeah, there was the statutes, the Geneva Conventions, what have you, and the Hague Rules, what have you. But no one had ever actually applied laws, what we would call at the time, laws of armed conflict to real world situations. And so we were training m members of the Judge Advocate General's Corps, uh, uh, Brenda Hollis was one of those individuals and uh, people from the Department of Justice going over to be seconded to your office uh, uh, and just teaching them on how to spell Geneva and how to uh, you know talk about the, the Hague rules, those kind of things. And so we would give, depending on the uh, time that they had, we would give them one, two, three, 
four days worth of training on this, give them all the materials that we could possibly put together for them, bundle it up and ship them off and wish them Godspeed. And Jim Johnson also was in my department too. And, uh, and so we, in fact, actually he was, you know, I was the chair, but I didn't sit down all the time and, and meet with them. Uh, but Jim Johnson was one of those individuals who was training people. And I mean, it was really a clean slate. I mean, they, no one had a clue about this law uh, uh, at the time. So yes, I did have a I did have a background, but you know, a lot of my my background also was uh, my wife called, likes to call me Forrest Gump because I happen to be kind of peripherally walking across in the back behind something that's important. And you know, uh, I'd been a special operations officer, a door kicker, a paratrooper, uh, intelligence officer, and at the time when I did get the call. Uh, I was actually overseeing about 80% of the United States intelligence community uh, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense and the two intelligence communities. So I was a little bit off the grid as far as international humanitarian law at the time when I did get that call. Which bed, you, which bed do you use? Which hat or someone else? Well, it, initially with that phone call, yes. So Richard. you get the phone call from who? Richard Haas, right? Well, yeah, uh, yeah. It was just I, I'd come home. Uh, my wife was uh, working in the Department of Defense as well, working in the Defense Intelligence Agency, and you know we. Like any DC wonk, uh, seven o'clock is usually early to eat dinner because you've been working up to that point and you know, everybody putting in their usual 60 to 80 hours a week in that crazy town. And so we had a, believe it or not, we actually had some time together and so we made some spaghetti and the phone rang. You know, those days, that's when the credit card companies uh, called you. <laughs> uh, we didn't have cell phones and stuff. There, there was this device on the wall. I have to describe it actually to my students because they don't, un <laughs> they don't, they don't understand that. So I pick up the phone, ir irritated, and I said, what? And he goes, Mr. Crane? You know, his name. So he said, which he identified himself, and I said, well, hello. You know, like, <laughs> heck, like you, kind of like out of the clear blue sky. And I, he said, would you, would you be interested in uh, being the U.S. nominee to be the chief prosecutor of the new tribunal they're putting together in, in West Africa. And I, I said, I might, but I said, am I a throwaway nominee? Because, you know, sometimes the United States nominates somebody because just they're the United States. Yeah. And, you know, I was going to be thrown away rather quickly. And I was very well aware at the time that we had, you know, this is just after the Bolton letter, we had just left the International Criminal Court, and the world is furious with us. Uh, so I said, yeah, I, I might be interested. And you know, kind of almost flippantly, he goes, well, we'll, we'll follow up on this. But I just wanted to give you this phone call. And I hung up, and I walk out in the kitchen. And my wife is irritated because dinner's ready. And I hadn't opened the bottle of Chianti yet. So I'm doing my thing with the Chianti bottle. And she goes, who is that? And I said, and I explained. And she just started laughing. And she goes, you're not going to get that. I said, I know. She goes, you're a Democrat. I know. <laughs> And you're an American, I know. <laughs> so we just promptly forgot about it and uh, had a wonderful dinner. Uh, and two weeks later, three planes went into three buildings, and we're in the Department of Defense. We're at war, and Sierra Leone and all of that just went right out the window. I was busy. and. Two weeks after that, towards the end of September, uh, Pierre Prosper, who was the ambassador at large for war crimes at the time, called me and he said, uh, Dave, could you send us your resume? And I said, you guys were serious about that? I said, you know, I said, Pierre, I'm, we're at war. We are doing, we're, I'm busy. He goes, well, could you just send me your resume? <laughs> so I said, sure. So my secretary sent my resume over. and. Uh, didn't hear much about it uh, for a couple of weeks, and then uh, finally, uh, I get this call uh, from the UN mission, our U.S. mission in the UN, saying that we've received your application has been <laughs> received, and we're going to be walking it across. John Negroponte is going to be walking it across the street to the UN, and I'm going. Yeah, the, no, this is, this, nothing's going to happen. So I said, "Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the courtesy of the call," and hung up and promptly forgot about it. Six months later, I get this call after going through several interviews, all of which were negative and all of which were angry and all of them shouting at me that I had no right to be even an applicant. Uh, and a week prior, I had been told that I wasn't going to get it and Ken Fleming was going to get it, an Australian, a good friend. We probably all know Ken Fleming. I thought, great. I, he's much better at it than I am. 
And I uh, told my wife, and we, I put the file back in my drawer and for forgot about Sierra Leone. Uh, then Assistant Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs calls me, and he goes, this is Friday morning on the 11th of April. Uh, he goes, are you, I have two internets, I have two computers, I have this classified version and the unclassified version. So he goes, is your unclassified version up? I said, yes. He goes, you might want to check this Reuters story, but it says an American has been chosen as chief prosecutor of the special court for Sierra Leone. I'm going, oh my God, what is this? Because I, I basically told him I'm out. And he says, is that you? And I, because they had known, I had told the Secretary of Defense and stuff that I had been, I was dancing around all of this. <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't know. Uh, so I called Pierre Prosper's office and I said, are you aware of this Reuters story? And there's this dead silence. He wasn't. There's dead silence from his end. And he goes, no, I know nothing about it. And I said, well, I don't either, so could you check? I had no more than dropped the phone. My secretary comes around the corner and her eyes are as big as the bottom of this cup, like, Kofi Annan is on the phone. I said, well, why don't you send him in? And he, in, in his very eloquent way, said, Mr. Crane, would you be willing to help me out in West Africa? I need your help, please. What am I going to say, no? Uh, I said, yes, Mr. Secretary General, it would be my, my pleasure. He goes, well, good, because I'm going to announce it in about a half hour to the world. And this is 1130, and so he's going to walk down at noon and, and announce it. Now, my wife, remember, knows that I'm not going, and now I'm going. So I said, I better make this phone call. And she was congratulatory, but I said, well, let's talk about this this weekend. Fortunately, it was on a Friday. And then I called Pierre Prosper back, who hadn't been called. I said, look, oh, by the way, I am now uh, the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And he goes, I'll see you later. i got to go tell Colin Powell. Click, and you, could, you could hear him running down the hallway, even from my Pentagon position. So, you know, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Louise Moreno Ocampo. Yeah. Um, from 1984 to 1992, you worked as a prosecutor in Argentina. Yeah. And you uh, were the assistant prosecutor in the trial of the juntas, which turned out to be the first trial since the Nuremberg trials. I was kind of working Jackson a little bit here. First trial since the Nuremberg trials in which senior military commanders were prosecuted for mass killings. Mm -hmm. Did that sort of launch you on a, on a certain stage, a certain trajectory, uh, which would get a, get you a, attention and, and, and kind of a... Yes. Directly, uh, you know, something not everybody probably knows all about that. Uh, just a, a lot of students just walked in. No, in Argentina, we have a dictatorship in 1976, 82. Argentina invaded the Falklands, Malvinas. We had a war. Margaret Thatcher was our liberator. <laughs> she, <laughs> she defeated our generals. And was, our country had coup d'etat in 1930. No democratic government ended its term. But in 1983, one of the candidates, the minority candidate, proposed to investigate the, the generals. <coughs> And suddenly he won, 52%. And our neighbor was Pinochet, so all Latin America was full of dictators, supported by US, by the way. And, uh, and uh, my country decided, Argentina is a crazy country, decided to prosecute the generals. Uh, the first day, this guy took office, he signed a decree presenting the case before the courts. So at the beginning will be a, mission, a military court, then the civilian court took, and then in 84, they called me to be the deputy prosecutor, and I told the prosecutor, guy, I never did a case in my life. This is my <laughs> first trial, because I was a clerk of the Solicitor General. So my job was to review Supreme Court decisions. My, my constitution is like a U.S. constitution, it's a copy. So I learned, I knew how the U.S. prosecutor work, but from the books and from the president, no real life. So I told him, look, I had no idea. I said, look, it's great that you had no idea because we cannot do it in a normal way we do it in civil law countries. We cannot do it with, with dossier. Invent something. So they gave me the task to investigate the crimes with zero experience. So I organized a team of five, six, seven, seven guys, 25, 23. Um, in Argentina, also got the, one of the first truth commission. So they collected 50,000 witnesses. And that was like a real investigation. So we select from there. We select the, 
what we learned in this case was how to investigate without the police. That was very useful for me, because then you investigate through the witness, the, the victims provide the information to you. So we called the, the person who was abducted, was tortured, so we asked, okay, who saw when you were abducted to, to neighbors, my uncle, okay? And then you have an habeas corpus was rejected, so we start to collect evidence on this side. And so that's what I did, five months of investigation. So, most importantly in your bio, most people probably don't know this, but in the late 1990s, you starred in a reality program in which you arbitrated private disputes. Essentially, we got to listen to these disputes, listen to the presentations, and simply said, you're fired. So, I just wondered if that, there's a current person who's in a high position in the United States, took the lead from you. I just was curious. <laughs> No, no, it was just, it was just Judy more. Because <laughs> it, was a, it was a crazy TV producer who invited me to do a, a, court, a court, like a private court in TV. And I believe in education, so each of you working in education, I strongly believe in education. So I was thinking, okay, maybe we can use, because for me, it was shocking. I remember one day when I was a prosecutor, I say to the journalist, the state cannot torture. And the guy put as a, as a big title in the newspaper, oh, the state cannot torture. Come on, <laughs> what's the news? But the news is the leaders of the, the dictatorship were in jail and we are saying the state cannot torture. That's the, norm, the, the expression, the, 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 the force of the law. And I was thinking, okay, if this happened with the media, we can do more with the daily TV show. So basically, for, for, for months, I did this TV show basically discussing small cases and was very useful. I remember a neighbor, a guy told me, how you can stop this TV show? I live in a very poor area of the country. My neighbors once a week came to see your TV show. And they asked, okay, you see the cow? They discuss the cow and the little things. And it's just for people. And it was massive, it was massive. So yes, I, I didn't many. My feeling was after I was 32 when I was the, in the Junta trial, and I was thinking I never could do something more important in my life. That is, so I do whatever I want now. So from, <laughs> from there, I, that's why I became wild. I, I did whatever I wanted, and including this TV show. So a reality TV host, I love it. Something novel. Um, then the Rome Treaty is signed in 1998, uh, and. Then on um, April 21st, 2003, you were unanimously elected the first prosecutor of the new International Criminal Court. H how did that come to be? What's the backstory? Big mistake, big mistake, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see this conversation, how we were appointed, and then I like it when you were at least discussing here the rules, how we establish the rules for the ambassador to select. Come on, guys, reality is different. They play completely crazy, different game, because it's you not know, crazy. I always remember, it's similar to like him, I received a phone call, I was parking my car in Buenos Aires, Prince Said office called me, off telling me, look, we are looking for a chief prosecutor at CC, your name now is in the top of the list, but we don't know if you like the job. <laughs> so, thank you, okay, I, will, I was going to New York, I will see you, okay. I told my wife this is a joke, it never happened, but it's fun. I would see this Prince Said, what he had to say. And I, in those days, I was appointed a business professor at Harvard. I was so happy being, going to Harvard, teaching at Harvard. For me, it was great. This, this was crazy. But then the judges were appointed, and then the position was postponed. And in April, if you, some country invited me to visit them to discuss the pos possibility. Uh, and in six days, I went to five, to, no, in five days, I went to six countries. First meeting was in your country, in Netherlands, the legal advisor and a nice guy who was ambassador for, for this, who was very lovely, very lovely lunch. Then I went to London, Christi, uh, Elizabeth Wilford, who was two days later resigned because she was again the war in Iraq, and it was, I was appointed in the middle of that. Then I went to Oslo, Rolf Fife, who was the legal advisor of Norway, very smart guy, very critical in Rome. I confused him totally because he was very legalistic and I was showing him how to investigate networks. I was showing, because in those days I was teaching at Harvard 
a, a case on how to investigate corruption, and I was showing network analysis and these things. The guy was watching me. I saw his face completely transforming, so I, I tried to stay to explain better what I was trying to say, but I think it was a disaster meeting. Then, in France, it was worse, because in France, they tried to talk to me in French, and I had a girlfriend when I was young, French, and then normally we talk in French, but I was thinking I, was, I could talk in French, and my bad English now erased completely my decent French, so <laughs> I cannot say one word in French, so I had to, <laughs> I had to tell him, yes, I understand what you're saying, more or less I understood, but uh, he ca I cannot say one word in French, so the guy was pretty pissed off. Uh, and then in Germany was the worst meeting, Hans Peter Kaur, who then became a judge in the ICC, he was, one of my last cases I was defending, uh, I was defending a, minister of a former Minister of Economy, very unpopular in my country, and they had some, some uh, cover page against me. So Hans Peter was very worried about that. And then became furious. And also, you are a member of Transparency International, an American organization. So you are working with Americans. And Mr. Cole, Transparency is in, here in Berlin. It's here. It's, it's founded by a German guy. It's in Berlin. I had to go show him the address and the map. So it was a disaster meeting. So last meeting was in Spain. It was OK. And I went to my house for the weekend. I said to my wife, OK, forget it. <laughs> there is zero problem. Yeah. But then she showed me in the paper, look, <laughs> you are pointing. <pointed." laughs> and to show, for me, in this meeting of these two days, I think I was discussing with Herman, the work in the, in the this court is so complex. It's so complex that it's so difficult to transmit to people. And that's why sometimes I became nervous when I listened some comments who are not nothing to do with real problems. And that, to show my lack of understanding myself when I was appointed, I was appointed and then they, they, they called me to go to, to New York. And before the formal appointment, stupidly, I request meeting with all the ambassadors because I was trying to be, show them I was good, I, I would do what I would think. That was the worst thing you can do, because then you can ruin your nomination, because it's, it's, it's an agreement. Don't reopen the box. I had no idea. I request a meeting. I have meetings with everyone. No one had any intention, any interest to discuss ICC, so there is no problem in the meeting, except one case, one ambassador, finally from Europe, asked me, OK, Mr. Ocampo, you came from a civil law country, but you work a lot in the US. Are you a civil law lawyer or a common law lawyer? So I was waiting for this question. So I took the Rome Statute and said, look, I am a lawyer, and this is my law. I will apply this law. Yeah, you know, you think it's a perfect answer. No, he was furious. <laughs> oh my God, he was furious with me, saying, no, you should defend civil law. That's your mission. That, that, okay, that story for me. Yeah, you laugh, but that is a real life. So I try to encapsulate real life is ambassadors represent their own country. And they don't care about justice or evidence or whatever. They care about, that's their role. Their role is to defend their own country interests. This guy wants to defend civil law, and that's it. So that's the problem. In Argentina, we have a national community who care about the crimes, a leadership who proposed the, the investigation, and then the prosecutor was the strawberry on the cake. You have the cake be below. ICC was a strawberry with no cake. <laughs> <laughs> I had to invent, I had to build the cake. And then all of you think, oh my God, the cake is awful, I don't like how it looks, it's yellow, it had to be white, no. <laughs> so all of you have want a different cake. So that is, for me, the concept to understand. And I was thinking on this, so, okay, all these people are passionate, no, all of you are passionate about this issue, spend decades working on that. And, but it's difficult to have an agreement between us. So I was thinking, okay, how I can, because I believe we should find a way to, to have basic agreement and discriminate what is basic, and these complexities, this complexity with international, that's for me. There are many narratives. It's about the witness, it's about the judge's decisions. 
investigation is very complex, but for me the narrative that is missing is diplomat and political leadership. Mark has to build a different app <laughs> to follow the ambassador of the Security Council, to follow the decision maker, because that is, the problem is there. We are used to the idea in the national system, when you expose a crime, yes, there are police and, and, just, and prosecutors and judges dealing with it, and no politician will oppose. In our life, you expose the crime and say, no, don't investigate the crime because a friend or because you are a, affecting a head of state or, or you are, uh, is, is in Africa or is in, in US or is in Israel, whatever. It's the, don't do it. So that is the real problem. It's not about the technicality. It's about, it's a strawberry with no cake. We need to build a cake, not discuss the strawberry. <laughs> Robert. Robert. By the way, this is all going to be a National Comedy Center tonight at 11. This is fantastic. It was great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> can I do a bit dancing for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can talk about the dog if you'd like. Um, so you, you really are just a fan of the Montreal Canadiens and, and then ultimately became an international prosecutor. How did that work? Well, it's funny because it was because of a dog. Okay. Yeah. One, you know, I've been... <laughs> I've, I've been a prosecutor since 98 at, in Montreal, and uh, a, a crown, a provincial crown, a real crown. Um, where's Michelle? Okay. Provincial. That was for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, you were. Sorry. Okay, we're good. Um, and one day in 90, <laughs> 95, I, yeah, 95, I'd switched over to the federal crown, uh, wanting a change. And uh, we used to make fun of the, the federal crowns when I was a provincial crown because we'd go in the courtroom with like 20 files. My first week, my second week and after my, my training, I went in court with 23 prelims uh, in one court in front of one judge uh, with I mean, times three witnesses per file, cops who didn't want to be there, defense attorneys wanted the best deal ever, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas, you know, the federal crown would walk in with his one file every other month or so, you know. And no witnesses, just cops who happen to seize things. And anyways, so I wanted a change, though, and I switched to the, a, new, a new unit of the federal crown. And I'm walking my dog one summer on St. Denis Street, which is a very nice street in Montreal, for those who know you. And I meet this guy, Luc Côté, who some of you know well. Uh, and Luc had been a, a, um, a legal aid lawyer. So when you're crown, uh, you know, legal aid is the guy you see or the woman you see every day that you negotiate it with, that you have to get along with, or at least, you know, reasonably tolerate so that you do your deals because otherwise the system breaks down. So I'd known Luke, good relationship with him. Uh, but I hadn't seen him in quite a while. But of course, I had switched as well. So uh, I asked him what he's doing. And he said, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm now, uh, he had been with the human rights mission uh, in, 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 in Rwanda, and then I'd switched over to the, ICTR, what started work, I think it was in the fall of 95, so just, you know, very recently. So he asked me, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm just, I'm the federal crown, I needed a change, you know. He said, well, he said, if you want a change, you know, it's about as big as you can get a change, why don't you come uh, and try and apply? So I applied, but if I had walked my dog on the other side of the street that day, <laughs> I'd still be a federal crown. <laughs> so yeah, it was all, it was a dog's fault. Then you got into the system, and you sort of worked through working with a variety of tribunals, but then ultimately got an inquiry regarding becoming the chief prosecutor of something new called in, in Cambodia. Yeah, I didn't warrant a, a phone call. I just got an email. Um, and that was very surprising because I w now, I, so I had done, yeah, I had done Rwanda, Kosovo, East Timor, Sierra Leone, and now I was back in Ottawa with the war crime section. Of, of our Department of Justice. And a year or at least a year before that email, I'd seen something on the web uh, that looked like a little bit like a 420 scam. Uh, we're looking for potential candidates for this potential court. Uh, send in your CV. Uh, because as you probably know, the, the, right after the end of the conflict or the armed part of the conflict, I should say, in, in Cambodia, a court to judge the Khmer Rouge was in the, you know, in, in was part of the discussion. Hun Sen, the then and now prime minister, had asked the international community for, in a letter that he didn't draft, he just signed, 
uh, for help in setting up the court and then immediately withdrew any support for it. And so for about you know, 20, 30 years, they argued about it. So it was always you know, there. And this NGO for whatever, I don't even remember the name of the NGO, put out this call for interest. And I remember sending a CV without a cover letter because I thought it didn't, you know, it looked, it looked very silly. And, you know, like I said, out of the blue, one, one afternoon, I got this email that says, you know, you from this nice Filipino lady in the, in the Ola, in Ola, telling me I've been shortlisted for the, you know, the post of uh, this uh, E triple C. And uh, we'd like to set up an interview. So I went to see my boss, who wasn't very thrilled because, you know, this was another, uh, another time when I was going to ask him for a, a little bit of a leave of absence to go somewhere else. Um, but first I called my wife and she says, what is this? What? I said, I don't know. I don't remember. And I didn't remember at the time that I had applied to this. Um, so I, you know, I, I obviously was very, you know, it was very flattering. And I said, okay. Um, and then my last assignment had been Sierra Leone where we had worked with a guy called Chuck Caruso. Yeah, Charles Caruso. Uh, Chuck, Charles uh, is, was a U.S. attorney who had been with us in Sierra Leone for a couple of years, I think. About a year and a half, yeah. Year and a yeah. And we got along well, and he was quite a character. And he, he went on subsequently to work for the, uh, the U.S. Uh, anti-corruption initiatives in Asia. So he had been based in Bangkok for quite a bit, and we kept in touch. And he was also shortlisted for this. So we showed up in New York together, and we, you know, we started hanging out. And um, go to the interview, and um, I'd, by then I'd done a little bit of research already on, on, on the court. Um, enthusiasm wasn't a word I would describe you know, <laughs> as, as, as a motivator or as a state of, of, of mind back then. It was, there was already obvious problems with it. And then I'm talking to Chuck, who's been dealing with Cambodians and their corruption issues, and Cambodia, year in, year out, ranks as one of the most corrupt countries in the world up to this day. And as you know, Chuck has a very colorful way of putting things. I won't repeat them because they're not really for, suitable for... But he had, a, you know, he had a very stark description of what it would be to deal with Cambodian authorities. Right? And this is a Cambodian court, right? a majority Cambodian court, Cambodian judges, etc., and the co-prosecutors and co-investigator judges. So that did nothing to inspire me. Now, after the New York interview, I was going to India for, for the office, for, for, for the war crimes. And in New York, I picked up some, you know, some information and you know, some, uh, I was reading. So all through the, the, the flight, I'm thinking about this. And the interview went well. It was uh, the, uh, who's the, the ICC judge, the French ICC judge who, who passed away. Uh, but he was in the first, mo in the first uh, one of the first panels. Jordan. Yeah, Jordan, yeah. So he was on the, he was on the, on the, I thought he, Sorry. This will be edited, okay. <laughs> Sorry, judge. Sorry, judge. Yes, sir. How are you? You have a bad relationship with him. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> now, yes. Now, yes, but not before. Okay, we say nothing here, nothing. So he was in the panel. He asked me, why don't you apply to be a judge? I said, I'd even apply for this one. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it was Louis Michel at the time was the, 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 the legal advisor. Anyway, so the interview went well, but you know, between, between my, you know, the stuff I was learning and Chuck and everything, I get to Mumbai and I decide, yeah, this is not, this is not. So I get to this very nice hotel. We actually had a fax machine in the room, which was a, a first for me. I was very impressed. Back then, the Canadian government could afford good, good hotel rooms. Um, and I sent a fax back to Ola saying, thank you very much, but I withdraw from consideration for, you know, personal reasons. So not only did I apply for this job, I didn't even want it. <laughs> uh, or I withdrew from it. And then when I got back to India, from India, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm giving a bath to my kids also in an evening. I don't know what these people, why they call in the evenings, yeah. but I'm giving a bath to my two kids who back then were two and three maybe, you know, my daughter and my son. And, you know, I got my hands in the suds and, I'm, you know, we're, we're having fun. And then my wife comes in looking very perturbed and says, there's the, either the ambassador for Cambodia in Canada or the Canadian ambassador to Cambodia who's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm singing smoke in the water to my kids in the bubbles and I'm, she tells me this. I was like, okay. So I get, go and get the phone. And it was the Canadian ambassador to Cambodia 
Donica Poitier, uh, who's now in Thailand, who had been reached out by the permanent mission in Canada and New York, telling him, listen, this Canadian is a good candidate. He shouldn't withdraw. He's under serious consideration. Could you do something about this? So she starts telling me how wonderful life is in Cambodia, how, you know, how happy my kids are going to be. And they were quite happy with it. Um, how there's no winter, so my wife will be happy. Uh, <laughs> my wife is from Rwanda, so winter is a very traumatic event in our lives. Um, so I said, well, OK, maybe I'll, uh, we can talk. And then so Ola gets me back to New York and tells me, what do you want? Well, not to that extent. But back then, I had the structure a little bit. And I, I think I said, I don't know if I said it in here or not, but if you had wanted to devise a court that could not work, you'd be hard pressed to find a better blueprint than the ECCC. <laughs> okay? Both in terms of statute, right, which clearly envisions that you're not going to go where you should be going, right, um, and the budget and the structure that, that it had. We were supposed to, we were dependent for investigation on the national police, for example one of the most corrupt, inept police force in the world that was supposed to invest, you know, to investigate two million debt. Uh, we, there was no budget for outreach. Again, we were supposed to depend on NGO. No budget for witness protection wouldn't be needed or the police could take care of it. I remember the Michelle Lee, the, the, the first administrator, telling me what that, no, no, they can come on moto taxis and we'll reimburse the, 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 the motos. Anyway, so. I got them to make some changes to the structure and to the budget and finally signed on, on the dotted line. Terrific. Uh, Richard, you're now the chief prosecutor of both the Yugoslavia and the Rwanda Tribunal. And then I'd be curious on, on some, certain instances that occurred where are the real politics, where opportunities or events occur outside. For example, uh, you, were, you were pretty um, uh, outspoken about the highly inappropriate and po the policy of the Western countries in declining to pursue suspected war criminals, singling out France, United Kingdom in particular, because just getting the defendants. And also, you were involved in preventing the Dayton Agreement. You, you kind of interjected yourself in that, which was a sort of a Milosevic moment. Did, did you feel like you had to respond to something that they were responding, essentially interfering in the court? Well, of course, the, 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 the political reality was, 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 was the, the fear I had that the tribunal would be sold down the river uh, uh, as a bargaining chip in, in the negotiations between the United States and the, and, the, and the leaders of the former Yugoslavia, particularly Serbia. And um, the, the, this, the, 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 this was a real concern, and I must yeah. say that, that leading, leading, le, leading journalists in, uh, in, particularly from, from the New York Times, warned me that this, uh, that this was a possibility and, 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 and I decided I had little option but, but, but to speak out a, a against it. Um, it, it. It was denied by, by Richard Holbrook in his book uh, called To End a War, I think, his, his story about Dayton. He said he would never have done that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that because the... the, the um, the plea I had made was that one of the provisions in the Dayton Accords, in the Dayton Agreement, should be an undertaking to hand over uh, war criminals who had been indicted by the ICTY. And th 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 that wasn't put in. And, uh, and, and that, of course, was a very weak, weak link from, from the point of view of the tribunal. So, uh, so I think, as, as Lewis has indicated already, I think the, there's a large gap between be, be, between the duties, the formal duties of, a, of, of an international prosecutor and, and the reality on the ground. I mean, when, when, when I indicted uh, um, for the first time Milosevic and Kovacic, I got a call to come and see the Secretary General, which was Gardi, the same Secretary General. And, and his, he said to me, how, how dare you indict Kovacic and Milosevic? We're trying to make peace with them. And I said, well, my instructions under the Security Council uh, as, as statute is, is to indict war criminals against whom there's sufficient evidence, and I'm, I'm doing my job. He said, yes, but you should have consulted me. <laughs> and, and I said, well, Mr. Secretary General, the, 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 the Security Council statute states that I'm independent, 
and may not take any instructions from any government or any other person. And I said, I assume that includes you. He said, it does. He said, that's why I didn't come to you when I heard that you were going to indict him. You should have come to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was his understanding of, of, of the independence so of, of the prosecutor. And he said, if you didn't come to me, he said, President Cassese should have warned me. I said, well, President Cassese, he couldn't warn you because I didn't consult him either. <laughs> But th 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 that was the situation. Of course, little, li little did Butruscoli or I know that within three or four months of, of that indictment, there would be the meeting in Dayton, which couldn't have been held if, if, if Karadzic and Maladic hadn't been indicted. So, so in fact, it, it assisted the, police, the, the, the peace uh, rather than the, the other way around. Right, yeah. but, but the other reality of the United Nations, the story that comes to mind is, 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 is after the call from, 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 from Nelson Mandela, I told Cassese I, I would do it. And that was about three o'clock that, that, that afternoon. And at, at 12.30, my wife and I were fast asleep when the phone rang, and it was Ralph Zacklin, who some of you may remember, who was the deputy legal advisor at the, at the United <laughs> Nations. <laughs> and, and, and he said, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd never heard of him. I, I, he said, are you... He said, I'm calling to find out if you're prepared to be the chief prosecutor of the United States, of the United Nations Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I said, Mr. Zaxton, are you aware of what the time is in South Africa? He said, yes, I know what time it is, but, but, I, but I, it, it's urgent because the Security Council is meeting on this within the next 24 hours. So I said, but uh, were you aware that I told President Kosezi at 3 o'clock South African time today that I was prepared to do it? He said, yes, I was aware of that too, but he didn't have authority to ask you, I do. <laughs> and and, and, and then, 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 then uh, the, the Security Council unanimously appointed me. And Zaklin then called me to, tell, to, 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 to say that the Security Council unanimous resolution has no force in law until you have a medical clearance from a United Nations appointed doctor in South Africa. So, so that, that, that went through. Zaklin then requested me to come to New York to be briefed uh, uh, on, on the job and to meet with the Secretary General. And, and he said, make your own airplane bookings. It's, it's business class and we'll reimburse you when you come to New York. I did that in good faith, got to New York, and, and I said, you know, I, 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 there, there was a question of reimbursement for the airfare. He said, well, I'm afraid we don't have the money at the moment. <laughs> he said, there hasn't been an allocation yet made. There hasn't been an allocation yet made to the, to the Yugoslavia tribunal, but he said, I hope by the time you get to the, to, to the Hague, because he asked me to come and meet the skeleton staff in the Hague, he said, maybe by the time you get to the Hague, the money will be available. Hmm. Well, it was, but I found, went to my horror, when I got to the Hague, there was Graham Blewett, and there were four, 14 Americans who had been gifted uh, to, to, to the Yugoslavia tribunal. They hadn't been paid either. And that, that, that was reality of the, 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 the parlance financial situation at the beginning of the tribunal. Charles. David, uh, you made the uh, uh, executive in the uh, branch in the United States government real happy, I'm sure, when you chose to indict Charles Taylor. You want to just tell them how happy you made them? They're still mad. <laughs> I stopped by the Africa Bureau recently, and there's a, still a picture of me, which they use as a dartboard. Uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, David could confirm that. Uh, but uh, well, again, uh, I, in, I indicted in Operation Justice, or I, I indicted individuals, and, in, and two weeks later in Operation Justice, I took them all down in a 55-minute arrest operation using the British uh, Paratroop, uh, Parachute Regiment, Her Majesty's Navy, the Iron Duke. Uh, as well as Pakistani special forces and American helicopters uh, without a shot being fired. There was one individual, and I announced that to the world, but there was one individual who I did not say at the time. He was already indicted, and that was uh, President Charles Taylor of Liberia. And I decided to withhold that for uh, obvious reasons and uh, wanted to choose a particular political moment where I could take him down in front of everybody for dramatic purposes, but also let the people of Sierra Leone know, as I've told them in my outreach programs, that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. And so I didn't do anything other than I began an operation called Operation Rope, where we began to play with his head. And uh, we knew, because we had developed uh, uh, 
uh, criminal information assets, or what we would call in the United States spies, in uh, his particular government and other governments within West Africa who were providing information to us. And uh, at the time, we were st I'd indicted uh, Sam uh, the Mosquito Bakari, who liked to drink the blood of his victims, hence the name Mosquito, as well as Johnny Paul Caroma. We knew the, where they were. Uh, they were working for Charles Taylor. Uh, Samuel Bakari was helping to destabilize Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, Johnny Paul Caroma was helping train the Liberian Army. And so we began to put out through an information operation uh, that Charles Taylor was harboring war criminals and that they, specifically naming who they were and exactly where they were because we knew exactly where they were and exactly what they were doing. And so Charles Taylor kept denying this and kept denying this and I kept pushing the press saying he is harboring war criminals and all of us during this time frame, and this is the time frame that you're actually going through your nomination process, you know, uh, the United States just decided to aggressively invade Iraq uh, under a, under a, a, based on a lie. And uh, so the world was moving that way. And I realized, because uh, Operation Justice happened and then the Iraq War started and the world just lost interest in West Africa, period. So I wanted to get the world back focused on, on what had happened in West Africa on behalf of the victims. And so I began to feed correct information to the press about Charles Taylor, what he'd been doing, knowing all well that I had a sealed indictment uh, in front of it, uh, in my hip pocket. So the world, we, the press starts turning around and, I, and finally Charles Taylor uh, admits uh, that uh, they're both in uh, Liberia. And I immediately, he took the bait. And so I immediately held a press conference saying that he is harming war criminals. Uh, we turn him over immediately, again, citing exactly where they are, what they're doing. Well, uh, finally, Charles Taylor said, uh, yes, we have, uh, we have found them. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Samuel Balkery has uh, been killed during the arrest operation to give him to the special court and that we will, uh, and, uh, and I, I went back on the press and I said, no, I, I, don't, I doubt that. And I s cited exactly what Samuel Balkery was doing. Uh, and so finally Charles Taylor came back and said, well, regardless of what Mr. Crane says, I'm going to uh, turn over Samuel Balkery's body. And we're still trying to figure out what happened to Johnny Paul Caroma, and I think we're still trying to figure out what happened to Johnny Paul Caroma, right, uh, Stephen? We think he's dead too, but, uh, but again, we, we don't have a body. So on my birthday, um, May 29th, 2003, he shipped Samuel Balkery back to me in a cardboard box. And I remember standing there watching the helicopter land at UN headquarters uh, and settling in and the investigative team goes out to take literally this cardboard box out of the back of the helicopter. Al White, my chief investigations, turned to me and goes, happy birthday. I never forget this to this day. Well, I finally decided, uh, and, and, and during this time frame, the revolution in, in Liberia is going on, and, and the rebels are pressing him in, in, uh, in Monrovia. And so John Kufor, the president of Ghana, called for a peace conference to maybe stop the killing. And he decided on the 4th of June he was going to convene all of the heads of state of, uh, of West Africa and other heads of state within the continent uh, to meet in Accra. And I went, aha. So at the time then, and I, I'm uh, trying to make this as brief as possible, well, we, some of the leadership team in my office got together along with the registrar and I said, look, uh, I'm going to unseal the indictment when he walks up the steps uh, on 11 o'clock, thir <laughs> uh, 3rd of June, 2003. And here's how we'll do it. Well, 24 hours prior to that, we'll send a letter to all of the co major constituents within West Africa, the U.S. ambassador, uh, the uh, British high commissioner, president of Sierra Leone, uh, as well as the SRSG, uh, the senior representative of the UN within Sierra Leone. The next day then, we would then fax a copy of Charles Taylor's arrest warrant and his indictment uh, to the Foreign Ministry of Ghana, as well as personally hand carry a copy to the uh, Ghanaian High Commissioner uh, in Freetown, which we did. Uh, and then I went down to, when that was confirmed, I went down to the UN headquarters at 10.55 uh, of that morning, 
And at exactly 11 o'clock, I read a, the, the, the secretary or the, uh, the press officer for the UN said, Mr. Crane is only going to read a statement. He's not going to actually uh, answer any questions. So I read a statement saying Charles Taylor is now indicted. It, it's amazing how sometimes you're lucky as, as you are good. Charles Taylor literally is walking up the steps at 11 o'clock as I'm announcing to the world that he is now an indicted war criminal. He walked into the hall and all of us, you know, of course it's getting out now and all of the delegations are getting word. And he walks into the hall and sits down and five heads of state of the, in West Africa move to the side and start talking furiously. And then they take Charles Taylor in a side where I'm told this now, obviously I wasn't there. They said, you've just been indicted as a war criminal by David Crane in, in Freetown and we have to ask you to leave. And so he went up the steps at 11 o'clock a president and went down the steps about 10 after 11 as an indicted war criminal and was swiftly sent back to Monrovia. Of course, the world erupted in many ways, and one of which was you know, half the world wanted, my, uh, wanted to hang me, the other half wanted to give me the Nobel Peace Prize, and nothing in between. I, there was nobody moderate about that decision. Uh, but I did it intentionally for political purposes. I wanted to humble the, the most powerful warlord in Africa at the time before the people uh, of West Africa and all of his good old boys that at the stroke of a pin, uh, you can take down even the most powerful warlord. So I did it intentionally for that. I didn't think they'd hand him over at the time, but I wanted to strip him politically in front of the world of his power and then after five weeks of really a horror story, that summer was terrible. The rebels attacked immediately. They went after him, uh, Charles Taylor. They, the U.S. entered the, uh, Africa for the first time since Somali with armed forces. Uh, U.S. Marines were diverted and sent to, uh, to Liberia. Uh, and then the U.N. peacekeeping uh, uh, force for Liberia arrived. And uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Jim is just about to give us the hook because this is the most fascinating, and I want to go another three hours. But we have a boat. We have a boat ride, right, Mike? Tonight, yeah, six, five, six, minutes. five minutes. Oh my gosh! Okay, we're going to start with Robert, and we're going to come gosh, back sorry, towards me. And uh, in a sentence, in a sentence, you all were chief prosecutors. You're all founding chief prosecutors. What do you want to say as sort of your own, maybe a, a sentence or two, maybe a legacy? of that time period that you were the chief prosecutor. So Robert, on the ECC. In two sentences or less. Um, probably the greatest legacy that the court, not me, that the court can have, or any of our courts, is leaving behind the truth or the answers for people who can't get them during our processes. To me, one of the greatest achievements that I was responsible for was, for example, coming up with this definitive list of the 8,400 and something people, persons, man, woman, children, who were killed at S21 and whose relatives, friends would never have known if we hadn't left that behind for them to find their own answers to their questions. Luis. I will do three minutes because I like a question. In 2008, I had to, I had evidence against President Bashir. France, UK, US told me not to do it, not to do it, not to do it. You destroy any chance of solution there. What I should do? Who say I should indict him? I should request a warning. Raise the hand, please. None of you will propose arrest. I should, okay, who believe I should? The question is, I am asking the question. I will repeat because I'm shocked. Maybe, maybe who believe I have the evidence against President Bashir? I did not before a minister. Nothing happened. I decided I had to do. And then I informed in advance to the Security Council that I will do. I will, in the next case, will be the person who give instruction to the minister. I said that. So and because of that, different governments sent to me different people to say me not to do it. So I had to make a decision. Should I go and request the arrest warrant or should I respect the will of the state and wait for a different opportunity? My question is to you. Who of you believe that I should 
go and request the regular for Basil. Please raise the hand. Whatever. <laughs> it's easier now than this, those days. Who believe I should not do it? I should respect the, the interests of the government and try to align with them. Come on, guys. Well, when normally I do this exercise, when I teach, it's 50-50. And that means that those who are supporting you don't talk because they, they believe it's normal you do that. But those who are in disagreement with you criticize you all the time. And then eventually they say, oh, but you are African bias and whatever. Um, my feeling is, in the same way, we have to learn about this complex political environment I feel you, the experts who are following this, should also do the same. And move, not just about mobility. I love the discussion with Helen about the appeal limits. We love that. It's easy. It's clear. The, we need to try to understand how to present this, because it's about relevance. When I was listening to Richard and David, and OK, in the last 20 years, was could not happen, happen. And in fact, when I took office, everyone was thinking, my judges were desperate because thinking the, the, the court would be closed. Some of them were talking to me, saying, do the case because the court will be closed. Now, it will not happen. ICC will stay there. The building is, is there. I see Helen has a job. So the, the, <laughs> the, no, yes, that's the point. Institution is there. The question is about the relevance, but not just about the relevance of, of the International Criminal Court. It's about the relevance of international law to manage violence. And that is, that is a real question for us, how we increase the relevance. And that's why I suggest to you today to investigate the terror thing, because the terror is a new challenge, and we are not answering that. Of course, we can discuss what each tribunal could do better or not, but that's the real issue. The real issue is we are going back to a time that war was a normal way to solve conflict. This year, I read in the US, the US military was proposing retaliate with atomic weapons, um, cyber attacks. There was discussion on that. And President Trump was su su suggesting to attack or not Iran. That is desperate. I think that is a real challenge we have. We need to invent something bigger. And that is, for me, the, our challenge. And so my point is, in one line is, yes, we, the found, we, we did together, we establish the, the idea, the idea is there, and we permanent there. But the issue is the relevance. That's our common challenge. Thank you. David? I'll just, I'll just leave you with a, a vignette. And really, at the end of the day, uh, I give all credit to the office of the, pro the people who worked in the office of the prosecutor from 2002 to 2012. They are the ones that were in the trenches and did uh, the important work. As I used to say, all I, ra all I did is walk around and look pretty. I was in McKinney in 2004, March of 2004, and I'd taken up a couple of the secretaries in, in the special court who never get a chance to see the country. they just go to the compound, work all day, and go back home. So I took them up in a helicopter uh, to a school where I always went to, and I was in the school in a burned-out auditorium. Uh, there was about 400 children there, and I'm sitting there. It's 95 degrees. I'm wearing a bulletproof vest underneath my shirt. You couldn't tell, but... You know, I had close protection people all around, but it, you know, they, I was standing among them, which I always did, and a young uh, child soldier stood up, uh, would say, he was about 12, I was told he was around 12, and he, uh, he, was, uh, he had the atonal voice of someone who had been deafened, he had lost his hearing in the combat, and he just fell into my arms and he said, I'm sorry, I killed people, I didn't mean it. And so as he's weeping in my arms, a young woman stands up from about from here to here. She's missing half her face and uh, had been intentionally stuck in a pot of boiling water. And she's holding a child. I don't know where that child came from. And she looked me in her, at, at me with her one good eye. And she said in, in Creole, seek justice for us. And I'd like to think we did. Richard? Well, I think the legacy of the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals were that they established 50 years almost after Nuremberg that, that international courts could work, that they could conduct fair, fair trials. And, and, and really, I think, I, I think that, that, that led directly to the, to the greater push uh, for, for, uh, for the International Criminal Court. We just had an extraordinary panel with some extraordinary individuals, the founders, the four pioneering individuals who launched the first 
modern era international criminal tribunals. Please thank Richard Goldstone, David Crane, Luis Marino Campo, Robert Petit. Standing, whatever. These All right. Are guys that are in my book, I gotta have a picture. I'm gonna get it too. That's right, you did. Thank you. Sure. All right. And Layla, we got here to here too. Excellent. There we go. There we go. Get my arm around there. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. All right.